Hello, Cornerstone Chapel and those that are joining us online as we continue our Wednesday night Bible series through the book of Deuteronomy, a series that's entitled Together Forever. Have you ever found yourself reading the Bible and just confused about what's going on? Often we're finding ourselves confused about something that God is saying or how God is acting or reacting to something that we're reading in the context. See, the book of Deuteronomy is an invitation to understand the heart of God and who he has revealed himself to be to the nation that he has chosen to be the stomping ground of his presence to bring redemption, to bring restoration through atonement that ultimately would be satisfied through his son, Jesus Christ. But that stomping ground with the nation of Israel, that relationship was one that God was very clear to define what it was to look like. Clear to define that to love God is to know his word and by faith receive it and to obey it. Now, this wasn't something that was done perfectly all the time, as we're going to see in our text today. Uh, We're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 1 through 32. But we see that God is understanding of this and as a father, lovingly extending invitation through repentance to come home, come back, to know restoration, to know healing, and to continue to move forward with him. See, God desires this relationship, but it's a relationship that must be on his terms because he is a holy God. So the book of Deuteronomy helps us understand what happens throughout the rest of the biblical narrative, even up in, through, and beyond to the personal work of his son, Jesus Christ. So I'm excited that you're with us on this journey through the book of Deuteronomy, and I want to encourage you. A lot of these texts and a lot of these chapters and verses are very weighty, and they navigate some challenging, challenging concepts that are even difficult for believers today to follow Jesus when it comes to recognizing that, yes, God is love, but he defines what that love is. As the creator, he has that right. And so I want to open in a time of prayer. I want to hope that you have your Bibles open with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And this study is entitled Together Forever. And I've titled it that because Deuteronomy shows us that God's heart is one that has the intention of us being with him forever. But what that relationship looks like and the quality that we're able to to know of his presence and love depends on how we choose to respond. So that said, let's go ahead and jump in prayer. Father, our God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the book of Deuteronomy. Father, I thank you that you inspired through your spirit, the author Moses, who was leading your people through times that were very difficult, as well as times that were a tremendous blessing in, in celebration. Father, we are reminded of the many seasons that we'll find ourselves in in this life. And I pray, Lord, that as we read about these very real experiences with very real people, Father, that we would that we would allow your spirit to teach us, to bring sobriety to our minds and our heart, Father, of the reality of this incredible relationship that we do have with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to know this, Father, and to embrace the work that you're doing through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be looking at the full chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 11 today. I've broken it up into three sections. The first section, verses 1 through 7, how God defines love, faith, and obedience. Section 2, chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. It's a different kind of land, a different kind of life that Israel would be stepping into. And finally, the third section, chapter 11, verses 13 through 32, how to tell the story healthy foundations for future generations. So let's go ahead and begin with point one, how God defines love through faith and obedience. And we see this in the first seven verses. If you would read along with me, Deuteronomy chapter 11, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments. And consider today, since I'm not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, Consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you, how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great work that the Lord has done. So the beginning of this, 
it, Moses is stepping in now, and he's speaking to the those who were directly delivered from Egypt, the parents that were standing there in the audience, not the children and not those who were born after the time of that deliverance. Moses is speaking directly to the people who were firsthand witness of what it was to be enslaved and now freed. What it was to be a firsthand witness to the signs and the wonders, the miracles that God worked through his servant Moses and Aaron against the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, and his refusal to let the people go. After each refusal, God brought judgment. And it was it's neat to look at that on a, another study, how it's reflective of the diverse gods that Egypt would worship. God would show that he alone is God and sovereign, ultimately leading the people uh, to be delivered from Egypt. And, and God wants, through Moses, the people to remember that this is who he is. They do not have the ability to make God what they want him to be. They have to be reminded that he alone is, is God. He has revealed who he is, and he, to walk in a relationship with him, must have that as a foundation. And we looked at this last week in Deuteronomy chapter 10, that God, we need to have before a holy God the foundation of fear, fear that is reverential submission in obedience to what God says and who he has revealed himself to be. And it may sound like that this is a, a another, that they were delivered from Egyptian servitude to being ser uh, being in bondage to the Lord God, but it's not. And, and this is going to be developed. There was going to be a freedom, but God is, is helping to build a healthy foundation. So in that freedom that they have, they do not slide in directions away from him. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But right now he's talking to the parents and I can imagine going through their minds, the freshness of, of what it felt like to be in Egypt while God was doing all of these miraculous signs and wonders. How Pharaoh would respond and increase the workload on the people. And, and Moses would continue to say, and how he delivered them, how you were able to look back over the sea that was parted for you and your children and your uh, livestock, your carts, everything that you had, your possessions were able to cross freely. And then Pharaoh's chariots, when released by the withholding hand of God, were able to cross over in pursuit of you. And what God is saying is, had I not intervened at all in all of this, they would have even in this moment caught up and destroyed you. But I brought the waters of the Red Sea down, crashing upon them, and they were destroyed. But not just then. Also remember that God is not a respecter of persons when it comes to sin. And as Pharaoh refused to obey God. The children of Israel at Mount Sinai had refused to obey God. And we looked at this again last week and God brought incredible judgment where many of them were slain by the sword and experienced firsthand that God is not a respecter of persons. And then he continues and he shares a story that we've not really talked about. And it's one that doesn't really come up a lot of times, but it's a, it's, it's a part of Israel's history and it's brought up here. And we're gonna spend some time looking at that but he brings up the example of Dathan and Abiram. Who were these people? These descendants of one of the, the sons of Jacob, of Reuben. Who were they? And why is Moses bringing them up right here and right now? We're going to take a look at this. This is found in uh, Numbers chapter 16. And we're going to be looking at this in, in quite det uh, the detail that the text uh, provides. It may seem tedious. But bear with me. I believe that the word of God needs to be read in its fullness. We have to understand context. We have to look at what's taking place. And, and, I, and I say this because we can take bits and pieces of the Bible and we can put together a Frankenstein, so to speak, to communicate something that may be the intention that we want to communicate, but not, may not be God's intention and in how he's communicating to us. So it's very important that we look at the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and understand the context. Who were these two individuals, Dathan and Abiram, and why does Moses bring them up right now? And what does it mean for you and I today? In Numbers chapter 16, it says, Now the sons of Korah, the sons of it, uh, Ishar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of a congregation 
chosen from the assembly, well-known men. So they gathered together, these two individuals, and they brought a party to Moses, very popular people, and they had the support of a significant um, part of the assembly of Israel. Now they assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far for all the congregation are holy. Listen to what they're saying. Moses, Aaron, you have gone too far in your leadership for all of us in Israel are just as holy as you are. For all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, all of his company. Put fire in them, put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the holy one. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. I've gone too far as Moses. You have gone too far, O sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord? The Lord your God. Before the congregation to minister to them. And that he has brought you near to him, all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? So Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram. And they said, <coughs> excuse me, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land of flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you must also make yourself a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? <laughs> we will not come up. And Moses was very angry, and he said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them. I have not harmed any of them. Moses said to Korah, Be present, you and all of your company, before the Lord, you and they, and Aaron tomorrow. And let every one of you take a censer and put incense on it. Every one of you bring before the Lord a censer, 250 censers. You shall uh, also, and Aaron, each his censer. So everyone brings their censer, put fire in it, and will come before the Lord and allow the Lord to define who is holy and who is not. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirit of all flesh, shall all one man sin, and will you be angry with the whole congregation? And the Lord spoke to Moses, say to the congregation, get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now look what's happening here. Korah and his sons, sons of Korah, came, and they brought 250 censers and were offering incense before the Lord God, along with God's chosen priest, Aaron and his sons. And as they come before the Lord, God tells Moses and Aaron, you two get out of here. I am going to destroy this congregation. They have rebelled against the word of God. And Moses says, Lord God, will you bring judgment over the whole congregation because of the sin of one man? And then the Lord God says this, separate, tell all Israel, separate yourselves from Korah, from Dathan and Abiram, separate yourselves from them. So now invitation goes out. See, God can command us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul and all of our mind. And we might think that we are in a relationship with God, but if we are not on God's terms through faithfully receiving his word and living it out through the power and the strength that he gives us, we are not following God and the relationship is not what we think it is. And a test like this is going to show who truly loves the Lord under his terms and who either loves the Lord under their own terms or doesn't love the Lord at all. Faith and obedience will always be the factors that define love with God. And so what happens, Moses uh, went out, communicated that to Dathan and Byram. The elders of Israel followed him. He spoke to the congregation, depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs. 
lest you be swept away with all their sins. So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Byram. And Dathan and Byram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. If these men die as all men die, or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all the belongings with them, they shall go down alive into Sheol, and you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. Now notice this, and because this is how this chapter is going to end and why we're going to wrap up with Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 1 through 4, Dathan and Abiram, who refused to come up to Moses with the sons of Korah, they come out of their tents with their wives and their children and stand proudly and boldly against the word of the Lord and against the servant of the Lord Moses and Aaron. And as Moses pleads to the people, pleads, come away from them. Moses said, if God does nothing, and they die a natural death, as is the course of all humanity, then God has not sent us. But if something supernatural happens and the ground opens up, you shall know that the Lord is God, his word is true, and we are his servants. And as soon as he finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their household and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. Fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. So what happened here? That the men who were standing there boldly in rebellion against the word of God, their families, their possessions, along with Dathan and Abiram, and their families and their children, the judgment of the Lord opened up and swallowed them. And a consuming fire came down upon those who were holding the censers contrary to to the way that God defined priesthood to exist. And you think to yourself, this is horrific. Is this the God? Is this the God of Scripture? Yes, it is. God is a holy God. We cannot make him to be what we want. He is who he is. And he has created and he has sustained and he is working to redeem. Now understand, what was in the heart of Korah and all of the people who perished? sin. This is why God takes sin so seriously and why, why he pleads and why he continually is in our faces with regard to sin. Do we not consider what it will cost us? For them and their families, it costs them their life. It costs them their place and they never arrive to see the land of promise. This brings us back to Deuteronomy chapter 12. So Moses is telling them, remember what had happened. Have fear, reverence as the foundation for your relationship with God. And he continues now. That's how God defines love and obedience. It's by receiving his word in faith and obeying it through his power and his strength that he provides. Now, where is God leading them? What is this land of promise? That brings us to the next section, verses 8 through 12. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today. You may be strong and go in and take possession of land that you are going over to possess, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you are entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So this is geographically going to be a different place. Why is God bringing to their attention that they are not going to have to go to the Nile, which all of Egypt survived off the Nile? So all of life was built around navigating that water into their crops and their cattle and just their overall livelihood and, and ability to live and sustain life. They are not going to have to live like that. 
God is going to water down upon the earth through the hills and the valleys, and it has a natural irrigation just in its geography itself that will bless them. And in this, they are going to know a freedom, not necessarily uh, freedom like you and I might be thinking. They are not going to have to do the amount of labor to transport water. They are not going to have to do the amount of labor to irrigate the water and channel it into their their uh, into the sustainment of their lives. God is going to bring the nourishment of rain right to them where they are living. However, just because they're not slaves and their slate is not full of a to-do checklist, in this freedom, do not get lost in becoming indulgent in things that do not honor God. In this freedom, God is going to provide them the means and the resource and the opportunity to replicate this loving relationship that they know with him. Replicate it into their children, into their neighbors, and to become a blessing as God promised Abraham to all the earth. And I'm reminded of a passage in 2 Corinthians where uh, Paul writes to the Corinthian believers and says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And in verses 16 uh, through 21, you can read on your own, uh, and I'll encourage you to read, he talks about the difference now in this kingdom of light that we are placed in in Christ, in God's kingdom, versus the kingdom of dark that we had come from. We have freedom, but in this freedom, we have tremendous responsibility to grow into in our relationship with God. It's the same thing that's happening to Israel now. And we continue on to the third point. Now, the first point, how God defines faith and obedience, how he defines love through faith and obedience. Second part, a different kind of land Israel's being led into. It, was a different, it would be a different kind of life. Be careful what you do with your free time. And then finally, the third portion, portion here, verses 13 through 32. Let's take a look at this. It says, if you will indeed obey my commandments uh, that I command you today, again, love, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all of your heart and all of your soul, he will give the rain to your land in its season, the early rain, the latter rain. You may gather in your grain, your wine, your oil. He will give you grass in your fields for your livestock and you shall eat and be full. But take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off of the good land that the Lord is giving you. So what God is saying right here is that people are, are to recognize that the blessing they are stepping into is re responding because God's face is upon them and upon the land. Even the land itself would be flourishing with the presence of God. And in this, we see such a, 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 a beautiful illustration of God's promise and restoration. When God causes his face to shine upon us in favor, when we stand before him through the atonement he provides, he sees us as he sees his son. And life just finds restoration. Where God steps comes to life. Where God blesses comes to life and fruition. And as we read in different parts of the Old Testament, we find that Israel would go through seasons of drought, no rain, the famine, pestilence. And this comes back to Deuteronomy. Those were signs that would help Israel to recognize they're being disciplined by God and they need to come to him in repentance of whatever it is that they've been distracted from him with. Be careful. Because if we choose to be distracted, if we choose to enjoy our free time, to overindulge, to become drunken, to become feeling like we're the ones that are bringing the blessing to our hands and we look to other gods, the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens. There will be no rain. The land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly from the land the Lord has given you. At no point in time would they ever know life outside of needing Everything satisfied through the God who loves them, called them, delivered them, anointed them, and promised to be with them and they with him forever. We need God every step of the journey. Every step of the journey. And Israel's being reminded of this. But how do we tell the story? Okay, all of these things have happened to us, but what does it look like to hand this on to the next generation? And Moses is repeating this now, but we don't have the right to tell the story any way that we want it. We have the responsibility to bear witness of the story that is. You shall therefore lay up these words, Moses said, of mine in your heart and in your soul. Remember, Deuteronomy was both 
uh, verbally communicated and it was written so they could go back. Moses wanted the first immediate audience to hear from his mouth the tone, the tense, the passion, the pleading, so that they would incorporate that into what they are reading and be able to pass the two together onto their children and onward and onward. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and your soul, and you shall bind them on as a sign on your hand and frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in the house, when you are walking by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Do all things to the glory of God. The same New Testament thought is brought out with our worship, every part of our life. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are just and of a good report, dwell upon these things, and all things give praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall put these words on the doorposts of your house and your gates. To days of the Lord, uh, your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them. Now, as Moses saying to literally write these things and carry them on your foreheads, write them down all around you. If it comes to the need for that, to keep your eyes focused on the Lord, then by all means. But they were to be so infused with this that like, like John Bunyan, who the, those who knew him said if you would prick his his skin, you would uh, break his vein, he would bleed out scripture because it was so infused in him. That's what God is appealing. Not the circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart. Have his heart written on our heart, his word written on our hearts. For if you will be careful to do all of this command that is commanded, verse 22, that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways, holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you. You will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot tread shall be yours. And your territory shall be from the wilderness of Lebanon to the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. So not only the immediate um, recipients of this promise, the very adults who were led from Egypt into the wilderness, this is predating uh, the rejection of when they stood before uh, the borders of the land of promise and refused to go in. They are standing with promise and potential. How they pass on the story of God, how they pass on the word of God through their declaration and demonstration of life would affect the seriousness that the children would take when they're handed the baton in the relationship with God. If they would have the foundation of fear and reverence or arrogance and pride like uh, the sons of Korah, Dathan, or Abiram. And it continues now. And it continues with what we're going to close, the final portion of this, that not only was that how they were to tell the story, but God is about landmarks too. And keep in mind that what God is talking about with the nation of Israel is not to necessarily be applied to the United States or other nations. We are not the nation of Israel under this covenant that we're reading about, um, this, this, this Sinai covenant, this land of promise relationship contract between them and God. This was a very unique relationship that Israel had with God that was meant to cultivate and be nourished into the his son coming God tabernacling with us as the gospel of John which we're studying every other Wednesday night from Deuteronomy shares with us in the first chapter now this is a particular uh, relationship with God with particular conditions that would allow them to know where they stood with God God didn't want to leave them guessing hey if it's not raining there's a problem now, God is saying, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall eat the blessing of Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, toward the going down of the sun in the land of the Canaanites, who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the Oak of Morah, just in case you're wondering precise locations? For you are to cross over the Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you possess it and live in it, you shall be careful to do all the statutes, the rules that I am setting before you today. What I love about this as these two mountains, even in their names, have such significance. So you have the blessing, which would Mount uh, Gerizim would symbolize the blessing. And then you had Mount Ebal, which would symbolize the curse. Mount Gerizim refers to a mountain that splits in two. 
So as God is leading Israel into the land of the promise, they are starting out on such a firm foundation, a good foot forward. And they have the opportunity to continue to move in the direction that knows blessing from God, or they can choose to turn away from God and go into the direction of curse. That's what Mount Gerizim represents, opportunity, invitation. Are you going to love the Lord your God as he requires and defines love to be through faith in his word and obedience toward it? Or are we going to go in a direction that is not that? And if we choose to do that, Mount Ebal, which is the curse. Now, Ebal means a, a gradual uh, balding, a gradual dissension. And what's captured in this is that we just don't wake up one day and say, I'm not, I'm not going to worship God. I'm done with him and walk away from him. There's gradual direction away from God that leads us to bear the fruit of no longer walking with God. See, the thoughts and the heart make decisions sometimes well before our actions will communicate the fruit of. And as we turn away from God and go in the direction of evil, we start to, we start to experience the weight of turning away from God. All of a sudden, right now, life might seem like it's normal as we're walking away from God. There's not too much to show that there's any problem at all. But then God sends word through his prophets to remind them what his word says, to invite them to come back to Mount Gerizim, to turn from Mount Ebal to Mount Gerizim, which is to turn away from something towards something else, which we call repentance. Repentance. And God would bless and heal them. He would restore them. If we confess our faults, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. At no point in time did God have an expectation that the people would earn his love by being fully obedient to the law of God, his word that he's given. It doesn't mean that they have a license to just do whatever they want because God is always going to forgive them. They have to come through atonement. They have to pass through in the Old Testament the offering of animals to shed their blood to temporarily cover them in this covenant of promise that would lead into the personal work of Christ. So you and I today have freedom from those regulations. However, in our freedom, let us not be arrogant to be comfortable choosing to sin against God. And you can say, what is the evidence that we are choosing to sin against God. It may not necessarily be rain withheld from us. It may not necessarily be famine that comes upon us. Sometimes we'll experience trials for doing the right thing like Job. How can we know the measure of God's word? Be under sound, healthy, biblical exposition and teaching that the spirit who dwells you by faith place in Christ can bring forth nourishment that helps us grow into the anointing, the sanctifying position that you and I have in Jesus Christ. See, what's symbolized between Egypt and the land of promise is symbolized for you and I today, represents, it was a shadow of our bondage to sin and freedom in Christ and his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. When we place faith in him, that he died for us, that he satisfied what we could not, the holy requirement of God to live life without sin, he died for us, the righteous without sin, for the unrighteous who had sin. And when we believe, when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we receive that, that gift of salvation. We turn from our sin towards God. We turn from evil towards Jerazim. And the word of God is all the blessing. We know how we are to be living, how we are to be walking, and how we are to be growing. And this comes back in this, this finale of Ephesians chapter 6 that I want to read with you. Listen to these, uh, these words from Paul, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Moses was very concerned, God was very concerned, that the people tell the story faithfully, accurately, the way that it has been given to them from God, the way that they have experienced under God's hand, the commands that God has spoken to them, not only in declaration, but demonstration. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. See, God wasn't commanding 
and bringing it down. No, do this or this happens. The heart of God is nourishing. God demonstrates his love to them by fulfilling the promise that he gave to deliver them from Egypt, to provide for them supernaturally all along the way into a land that God is giving to them. God has demonstrated his love in ways that, that defy natural measure. God has shown who he is. And what he's inviting them to be is in relationship with him. But he is a holy God, and these are the conditions. And see, for you and I today, as believers, we need to not only to our immediate biological children, but those that we are spiritual parents in the lives of. We need to be not only knowing God's word and teaching it, communicating it, but demonstrating it. Because we have been have received the demonstration of God's love, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So you and I fall under the same invitation that Moses leaves the children of Israel with in the end of Deuteronomy chapter 11. We stand before a blessing and a curse. There is only one straight and narrow way, and we need to know God so that we can by faith receive his word and in his spirit, his power, his presence, live it out and be transformed along the way. Every yes to him, every step in obedience and declaring and allowing that to be demonstrated through the fruit of our lives into our children and the next generation that we can hand on a healthy baton to a healthy hand built on the foundation of love love that God defines as obedience by faith. Next week, Deuteronomy chapter 12. If you have time and want to navigate the going deeper questions that are located in the comment section, wherever you're watching this, go ahead and send them back to me. I'll keep record of it. If you have any questions, reach out. I love to help us go deeper, but this has been Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, week 16 of our Together Forever series. Father our God, thank you so much for our time together to study your word. Thank you for your spirit who leads us into all truth. Your word is alive and it's powerful and it pierces us and, and at the very core of who we are, addressing every part of who we are. Father, you are a holy God, and you have lavished your love on us. You have demonstrated such a love that while we were yet sinners, you sent your Son to die for us. Father, thank you for the gift that through faith we can be saved. We can come from the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We do not need to go in the direction of curse and evil, but we can turn back, turn to you through repentance and oh blessing of walking with you and your face shining upon us to know the restoration that you bring into our lives and ultimately this world. Father, thank you. What incredible love you have lavished on us through your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us, bless the study, may be fruitful in helping us be nourished to live for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray all these things in him. Amen. Take care. God bless. Until next time. Bye.